Hi, I'm Ken Crawford, president of the Alaska Conference, and I want to show you around my Alaska. I love it here. This is not the end of the world, but it's pretty close. I love Alaska. It's the greatest adventure you could ever imagine. If you want to find out more, go to our website, alaskaconference.org, and you'll find all kinds of information and stories on what Alaska is like. There's a constant collision between civilization and nature because we live next to each other. There's a feeling of remoteness. Not isolation, but remoteness. Welcome to Alaska's biggest village. This is Anchorage, and I want to introduce you to this vibrant growing school here. This is Anchorage Junior Academy, and it is on the grow. So come with me, we're gonna go inside. I want you to meet some of the teachers and some of the students. In fact, we might even get a chance to go out to the playground and watch the students there. So come on in. King Crawford's gonna tell you guys a story. And so you guys can sit right here on the rug. Let me. Okay. Get. We are so excited. He's a. They love when he comes. Zach, you want to have a seat? This is my favorite Thank story. You. Hi, I'm Ruth Atwood. I'm uh, teaching a school in South Anchorage. Um, I'm from the great state of Texas originally, but I moved all the way here two years ago from Georgia, from a public school situation. It was real challenging there talking about Jesus, but here. I can talk about Jesus every day, every minute, and this, the students are so open to that. Um, my favorite part of the day is when we go to our Bible Center and tell about what Jesus has done for us here. Over here is where we talk about the truth of what God has for us and how much He loves us and that every story that we know that comes from the Bible is truth and that's what, that's where we are here. And so. Uh, they love opening their Bibles, looking up the stories. We read their Bible story out of their book, but we read it out of the Bible to see, to make sure that all the, all the facts are there. Um, they open up their Bibles also to look up their memory verses, and it's a really, a, a really cool thing here. We also have butterflies. I want them to know that God is the maker of the creation of all things, so we we, I change out this once a month. I just got to go through my whole room and change out and make different centers. So we just moved this center over here. Oh, I have to show you this. Um, I have it hidden a little bit right now, but it's a little messy. But this is our dinosaur. We're going to be planting a little bit later. The kids here don't get muddy very often. So um, this is kind of a unique thing for them. It's too cold outside when it is muddy. It's, it's called breakup here. I always call it the fall, but they call it breakup. So the kids play in the like to play in the mud, but it's kind of funny because they always want to wash their hands after about five minutes of it, <laughs> so, which is like unique. Her hands dirty. No, you don't. I don't like her hands dirty, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Hi, my name is Kim Purvis, and I teach first and second grades here at Anchorage Seventh-day Adventist School. And we are so happy the way God is blessing our school. Two years ago, we had 12 students. Today, we have 56. <laughs> Having a relationship with God is not just prayer and Bible study, but serving Him as well. We learn a lot about the different natives and cultures. In fact, in my classroom along, I have six different cultures. And it's been a good learning experience for me, as well as the children together. This is called the Heron's Fountain. And this was the gentleman that invented the steam engine, also invented this little contraption here. And so this is the first time we've tried to make this. Here in Anchorage, they've got a wonderful gymnasium that, you can, that they built here. And you can see, they just put a brand new floor in here and all these kids. Notice their uniforms. They all wear uniforms here. Pretty cool, huh? Well, this is our largest school here in Anchorage. Uh, hope you enjoyed visiting it. I want to show you our smallest school. Come with us. We're going to go 400 miles northeast of here to Toke, Alaska. And a little school started by Francine Lee with only three students. So come, let's go take a look. We're just east of Glen Allen, Alaska, in the central part of Alaska, and this is the Wrangell St. Elias Range. These two peaks are kind of the Mount Everest of the Wrangell St. Elias Range in central Alaska. You can see on your right Mount Drum and then Mount Sanford. 
Mount Drum appears to be a little bit bigger, but Mount Sanford is 16,200 feet tall. My name is Francine Lee, and I'm here in Toke, Alaska at our little school, Arctic Light Academy. My husband and I and our two sons moved to Toke, Alaska 21 years ago. I was a newly graduated nurse in Oregon, and my husband was a newly uh, journeyman plumber. House was built in sections. The first 24 feet was uh, all built when we first moved here. Then we built an addition on it for a place to worship. Uh, for the church family. There was no Seventh-day Adventist church here. The year it was built, uh, ASI helped us build an actual church. So we've expanded into that space and now Francine's using it for a little school. We moved up here because we wanted to see the work of God in Toke and because I had a job as a nurse at the local clinic here. And that's what brought us to Toke. This house burns a lot of wood. It's the only heat it has. And uh, counting what we burn in the greenhouses, we burn about 24 quart on a real cold year. As a nurse at the Toke Clinic, I often did counseling for diabetics. And it became clear to me that there was a major need in Toke for healthier foods. There's no locally grown foods here, unless you grow your own garden, which I this do. This greenhouse belongs to Don and Francine Lee. I want you to know it's still winter here in Alaska. Well, spring. But in the winter, it gets down to 75 below here. But in the summer, with almost 24 hours of daylight, they can grow things. I was here last summer, and they had tomato plants that were probably eight and a half, nine feet tall, with tomatoes on it about this big. There was, it was amazing to see, and they tasted delicious because this is all organic. Eggplant, zucchini, they can grow just about anything in here. Now this is all a part of their organic vocational education system for their school. So the children that go to their school that they're developing here will also have as a part of their education learning how to develop a greenhouse and how to grow it. In the early spring and late fall they keep a couple of wood stoves so they can keep a little bit of heat on in here in the winter in the, the evening and at night. Toke Alaska is a long ways from anywhere. We are 300 miles from the next nearest church school, 200 miles from the nearest hospital, about 100 miles from the Yukon border. And uh, we're just a long ways from anywhere. Um, this is Alaska and my wrist is like the Canadian border and we live right here. One of the things I believe is that this little school, this little pioneer school is going to grow. We've already had several parents inquire about it. And I think one of the reasons why is that we have a Seventh-day Adventist radio station on air here since 1998, KUDU. Come along, I'll show you. Come on in, welcome to KUDU 91.9 FM in Toke, Alaska. We've been on air here since March of 98. We are associated with Life Talk Radio and we've been on air 24 hours a day. This was the first room in the house that got finished. Our little log cabin was still in the process of being finished as we lived in it. And this room we finished up first, actually got carpet on the floor and sheetrock and painted on the walls. It's been uh, quite a job learning this. I fortunately don't have to do an awful lot in here, but we had to put all the components together and put up the tower in the backyard and the satellite dish. It's been quite a learning curve. Uh, we felt it was more important than finishing our bedroom or even the kitchen and do the Lord's work in a proper environment. This truck's kind of a miracle truck. I lost it into Moon Lake last summer at a church picnic. Had water clear over the roof. Oh, the, I've got a little boat the kids like to play with, the church kids. And I was launching the boat and didn't get the brake mashed down well enough. And the truck rolled off into the lake and made the Lord a deal on it for every mile it runs. I give a, a penny for towards missions. And, uh, most weeks it ends up being about an $8 offering for missions. This week will probably be a few more miles than that because I had to make a trip to Fairbanks. <laughs> Oh, and the truck went in the lake. There were some life jackets in the front seat, and one of them floated up and uh, hit the windshield wiper switch and turned them on. So when the truck went underwater, the windshield wipers are out there going like this, help me, help me. 
was, it was a sight. They were still actually running when we got it out of the lake. It uh, took a couple days work to get it running again, and when it did get running, I think it was a miracle because it, uh, it has some unique features since then. No radio, no horn. I started with a, uh, a single pole light switch, just like a light switch in a house. Because uh, the steering column got all wet and it uh, actually caught on fire after it was out of the water a while. This is Alaska and this is my miracle truck. Hi, welcome to the Matanuska Glacier. I wanted to show you this glacier because 75% of the land mass in the world is actually covered with glaciers, which produces most of the fresh water that we have in Alaska. Now this glacier starts probably about 50 miles or 60 miles inland at the 10,000 foot level and then slowly it makes its way down to the, to the face of the glacier here. In Alaska you can see global warming. You may not believe this but the face of that glacier is probably around uh, 200 feet tall that you can actually see. These glaciers move very slowly. In fact, if you watch carefully, you might miss it moving. But glaciers actually move just a few inches uh, a year, sometimes up to a foot a year. And they actually, the bottom of the glacier moves faster than the top. As the bottom of the glacier slowly moves, it grinds and it pushes rocks and things in front of it and grinds them down into smaller rocks. It's an amazing thing to get close to these glaciers and see how huge they are. This one is probably about maybe 35 or 40 miles across the face of it. If you look along the edges, you'll see what's called the lateral moraine. That's where the rocks are pushed up on the side as the glacier moves forward. Finally, it'll form what's called the terminal moraine, which is the rocks will push up in front of it until finally it forms its own barrier and then it melts. When it does, then you have a beautiful lake. Have you ever been to Lake Louise in Alberta, Canada? That's what it is. It's a, a terminal moraine that forms its own lake. If all the glaciers in the world melted, it would raise the sea level about 200 feet compared to what there is now. And you see in Alaska how fast the glaciers are melting. Some glaciers have moved back about 50 miles or 60 miles from where they originally were 40 or 50 years ago. Richard Dennis has been a teacher in what we call Bush Alaska or Village Alaska for decades. Let's go with a higher step. He is a master teacher. We have to subtract one riser to come up with a number of treads. We're going to his village where he's teaching right now, the village of Mantasta. So come with me and we'll meet Richard. Welcome to Mantasta, Alaska. My name is Richard Dennis. I'm a, uh, a rural educator. Uh, working in the public school systems here in Alaska. I've taught uh, from, uh, from the Aleutians uh, to the Arctic most years in, uh, on the Yukon Delta. As a Seventh-day Adventist Christian, I've uh, sometimes uh, or seldom been able to find a, uh, another uh, uh, Adventist educator. Uh, there just aren't very many of us uh, in Alaska. The school systems are looking for public educators. If you're interested, think you might be interested, if you're an educator of, at some type, some level, there are opportunities, whether it's from elementary to high school, whether it's uh, support staff, uh, particularly, uh, say, special education teachers. School districts uh, find it uh, a little hard to fill the positions. They'll start as early as January looking for administrators, and certainly by March and April, they're looking for uh, teachers and they'll travel to uh, job fairs as far east as Minneapolis looking for this. So the, 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 the hunt is on and they're not able to quite fill every position uh, when, when, uh, each year. Some positions are not filled until uh, school starts. So there's opportunities and, and so if you have thought that you would be interested in Alaska, I urge you to follow through on that because there are openings. Come on up and teach with me here in Alaska. Richard's wife, Judy, 
was a missionary in Africa for many years, but now she and Richard run an Adventist bed and breakfast called Red Eagle Lodge in Chistochina, Alaska. It's on the Toke Cutoff. It's right on the way if you're coming to Alaska. But it is an amazing Adventist bed and breakfast. All these cute little log cabins, and they even have a glam tent with a feather bed and a wood stove, and they've got an old bus converted to a fishing motorhome, which is amazing to stay in. This is our latest addition to Red Eagle Lodge. We've had this campground lodge, cabins, this old historic site for five years, sort of fell into it and have been developing ever since. Owning this B&B allows us to have people come to our door. I used to love to travel. I lived in Africa for years. Here, people come to our door and we have a chance to share with those who are interested or asking questions, the love of Jesus. The peace and beauty here speaks of the Creator. People say that. I have to tell you how we got into this. Long ago when my parents were dating, they did a scrapbook and in the scrapbook they put a poem that I have now in my living room and at the front of the guest book. It says, let me live in a house by the side of the road where the race of men go by, the men who are good, the men who are bad, as good and as bad as I. I would not sit in the cynic seat nor hurl the critics ban. Just let me live in a house by the side of the road and be a friend to man. And that's our motto for this place. This is the latest addition to Red Eagle Lodge and I'm looking forward to spending time at lakes and rivers and going salmon fishing. You can see the cabinet maker designed everything. Wood floors, wood cupboards, even a wooden first aid uh, chest. This is Red, the mascot for the bus. This is a burlwood post. This uh, craftsman thought of everything. It is finished so nicely. It has all these built-ins, uh, drawers for CDs, um, systems built into it. These are hand-painted fish tiles. The drawers uh, just slide beautifully. Underneath is the ice chest for keeping your salmon. Outside is a back deck with a wooden box for wood and my son is making a, a shower curtain holder so we can have solar hot water to do a shower on the back deck when you're in a campground with no showers. As you can see there's even an opening underneath if you have a little dog or a little cat <laughs> or a little kid. <laughs> and these are blackout shades out of canvas. Um, Whatever you think of for a simple escape into the wild, it's here. If you want to come stay in our fancy bus or in our tent or cabins, come to Red Eagle Lodge in Chistochina on the Tote Cutoff. Now I'd like you to meet Steve Steenmeyer. He has new and creative ways to share his newfound faith. One is in prison ministries with over 750 Bible studies going. And the second one is his theater production that he's doing on the life of Paul. I became an Adventist a little over four years ago. I studied Adventist doctrines in order to prove my wife wrong, and I couldn't. So, uh, so I gave my commitment to the Lord. I'll never forget the first, one of the first things after I was baptized, uh, my wife Tina, uh, had me read Matthew 28, uh, the last three verses, and she said, um, so that's what you need to do now. That would be discipling others, etc. And I, I, I responded with a, a laugh, I mean, quite a negative response. I said, no, 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 no. He's talking to his disciples. And she said, are you his disciple? And I couldn't respond, no. So uh, that's what brings me um, into a, really a life of ministry, not a, a paid, ordained pastor or anything like that. That's not my goal. But um, I've become extensively involved with Correspondence Bible Studies. As a result of changing our focus um, within the last nine months or so, we now have over 700 inmates and associated spouses and or families, um, referrals, uh, involved in, uh, enrolled in Discover Bible Schools. 
And so that brings us up to date. And uh, I got to tell you, it's one of the most exciting ministries I think a person could be involved with, whether it's as a support to it in terms of all the the mailing and, and the clerical work that's involved with it, or actually going into the facilities. You couldn't find a more receptive um, congregation, if you will, than within a prison ministry. I have a garden that I'm growing outside, and I thought it might be interesting for you to see a, a first-year gardener. Years ago, I had a garden that did quite well, but I, I, I abandoned that. But uh, now that I'm sort of retired, uh, other than the ministry, I decided this year to put it in a garden. You want to go see what it looks like? Great, let's go. Well, I'm going to take advantage of being out here and do some watering. This hot summer, that's pretty important. And uh, let you know what I got going here. And these rows, we got five beds of peas on this end. Another lettuce, and then there's some um, zucchini growing over there. I got some peppers radishes up here. A lot of these plants started coming up within uh, four or five days of the seeds hitting the ground. Alaska summers and gardens go great because they say that we have more a longer growing season than anywhere else in the lower 48 due to the long daylight hours. One of the things I'm going to be doing is starting an independent ministry taking a one-man play. I have a degree in theater and um, Years ago, I did a one-man play. It was very fulfilling. I toured Alaska and toured Colorado and did it in our theater. When I became an Adventist, the first book I read that Ellen White wrote, wrote was um, The Great Controversy. And when I read the part about Luther, I thought, well, here's a one-man play about Luther. All you have to do is change the third person to the first person, and you have a beautiful one-man play and then I found uh, Acts of the Apostles and Life Sketches of the Apostle Paul. And years ago, I thought there ought to be a one-man play about the Apostle Paul. Well, there it was. And so, uh, over about three years of rewrites and editing, so you could get it down to a performable piece, comes a dynamic play about the, the life of the Apostle Paul. And so, coming soon to a neighborhood near you, in a sanctuary close by, will be <laughs> Paul, the man who turned the world upside down. Been doing a little work on my plane, getting it ready for uh, to fly again. Had to redo my cowling. I'm in uh, my friend Dr. Steve Libby's hangar. He has this beautiful 185 Skywagon here. He was born and raised in Dillingham, lived in Alaska all his life, and is a top-notch bush pilot. But here in Alaska, you have to be equipped for just about everything. As you can see, uh, Steve has a nice set of skis on his so that he can land pretty well anywhere that he wants to. One of the keys to flying in Alaska is safety. And so everybody works to try to keep their planes in top-notch condition and everything the best that it can be. Well, we had another snowstorm last night and uh, it's time to clean off my faithful bird. This plane has carried me a lot of miles all over Alaska. And uh, in Alaska, about 80% of the villages are only reached by air. So the only way, if you don't have a means of transportation like this, then you're pretty well stuck. So this has been my faithful 172 Skyhawk. It's a wonderful plane for Alaska. I've got big tundra tires on it so that I can land in small, short uh, gravel strips or on the beach if I need to. A lot of times I land on the beach. And so it's uh, been my means of transportation for a long time. But it, it's been sitting here and gathering snow from this last snowstorm. So it's time to get it cleaned off and get it out and ready to fly the skies. It would be uh, nice if I could afford the luxury of a hangar, but uh, on a pastor's salary, that certainly isn't an option. So the, my, my nice bird sits out here in the, in the weather. We're at Merrill Field in downtown Anchorage, and uh, this is one of the busiest general aviation 
uh, airports in the world. 20,000 flights a month come in and out of this airport. So you have to, uh, you have to be on your toes flying in and out of here. Come out here faithfully and clean it off and get it ready for the next flight. Now that the days are getting a little bit longer and the weather's not quite so bad, it's a lot easier to fly than in the middle of the winter here. When you only have about five hours of daylight and the, and the weather's pretty dicey in the middle of the winter, you never know when the next major storm's gonna come. And so usually from middle of November to February, I don't fly a lot. Just short trips around central Alaska, but I don't cover much from the villages. Oh, we have several mission planes in Alaska. This happens to be my own personal plane, but we have several mission planes that are owned by Adventist World Aviation. And those mission planes are stationed at different parts in, in Arctic, and uh, they are the lifeblood of our work in Alaska. And we have outstanding bush pilots. I know that there's young pilots that would love to come to Alaska and fly, but you have to be uh, uh, fairly experienced to be able to fly in some of these remote areas in Alaska. Once you leave this airport and you head into those mountains, there's not much uh, left for places to land until you get uh, through the mountain range. And that's kind of a special art, uh, flying through the mountains in Alaska. For my Alaska, this has been Ken Crawford. Thanks so much for coming with me. If you enjoyed watching this series, if you're interested in what you've seen or what we're doing in Alaska, go to the Alaska website, alaskaconference.org, and there you'll find additional information.